Hello, Michelle. Hello, Julie. Oh, <laughs> lovely to see you. Now, Michelle Collins, actress, writer, producer, household name. You have graced our screens as Cindy Beale in EastEnders, Stella Price in Corrie, and a host of top TV dramas, including Can't Buy Me Love, where Martin Kemp played your husband, and I played your best friend. Oh, yes, yes, we worked together, didn't we? I think we were dinner ladies or something. Julie, can you just stay there a second? My dog is barking at the door. Can I get him? I can I hear him. Your Wait, dog. I'm no, free. Get your dog. Come on, come on. Come on, come here. Come on, come and say hello. Oh, bless him. This is Humphrey. <laughs> oh. Say hello, Humphrey. Hello. Oh, that tongue. Humphrey, you are gorgeous. Say hello. Humphrey's a rescue dog. Excellent, great. I want a rescue dog. <laughs> well, you can chat too, darling. <laughs> right, you stayed in there. Yeah, that was, um, that was based on a true story, wasn't it? About a man who basically pretended he'd won 20 million and managed to fool his wife as well as everybody else. Exactly, to keep you. Um, but, yes. uh, but no, it was, it was great. I loved that job. But what I wanted to ask you is, um, how's your life in lockdown? Because weren't you on stage in the, in the Harold Pinter's The Birthday Party, weren't you doing? Yeah, we'd, um, we'd, I was just, we'd, we had a week's rehearsal and I was just about to do The Birthday Party, yes, playing Meg, which is yeah. a fantastic role. And I've never done Pinter before, so I was really excited, some really brilliant um, actors. And we rehearsed for the first week in London. And then on the Monday, went to work. And I think we sort of knew things were starting to get bad and I had a feeling it wasn't gonna, you know, happen. And then in the evening, we just got an email saying, don't come in tomorrow. Uh, we, we don't know what's going on. And, and at first I thought, okay, we're just going to have to learn our lines at home. And then maybe we'll, because we were opening at Cheltenham, Cheltenham, um, uh, every man. So maybe we'll just go to Cheltenham. And actually, and then that was, we got another email a couple of days later saying, yeah, it's gone. It was um, not rescheduled. It's just completely finished. It was a three month national tour. Oh. So, and we were all very, very disappointed, to say the least, because it's not just the actors, is it? It's, it's everyone else involved, it's the crew, it's, it's... And I think, you know, and a lot of people had bought tickets because it was... We were going to Manchester, Edinburgh, Oxford, Cardiff, Norwich, a lot of places, you know, but that's the way it is. And then I was also going to Edinburgh in my one-woman show, which was the first time I've... I mean, I've been to Edinburgh as a... As a um, you know, just to see things, but never actually been anything. It was my first time, so I was a bit gutted about this. So there were two things that I'd lost. <laughs> anyway, so... Edinburgh Festival and the tour, because as you say, it's not just the actors and the crew, it's the audience. No, it's... it's and, and Edinburgh is one of the biggest festivals in the world, and I think, mm -hmm. you know, not just theatre, TV, film. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a big, big disappointment for people, I think. And we'd, we'd, all, we'd booked our venue, we'd, we'd already taken pictures, we'd had the poster out, we'd done lots of, because you've got to prepare very early on for these things. Yeah. But you know what, never mind. We can, in fact, we're doing a Zoom chat with that. We're doing, um, we're doing a read-through of it on Zoom with the, another, because I'm co-producing it with the writer, and, oh. and we'll see how it goes. And we may do it as a radio play or, or maybe stream it, I don't know. Or next year at Edinburgh. Yeah, it just, be, it just feels a shame to wait a year. But you know what? We don't know what's around the corner. It's very hard to social distance in a theatre, isn't it? And I think also, you know, if you, the smaller theatres, if you say to people, which are hard enough to run as it is, if you say, OK, you're only allowed 50 people, you probably financially, it's probably not viable. It's not financially viable to no. open a theatre for 50 people. And I, I, it's really, it's really going to change. Mm. Um, everything for us all but you know um we have to take it seriously and we all know it is this uncontrollable virus and people are dying and i think that's just what we have to remember that it could affect our loved ones and our friends it could affect us exactly so that's the most important thing and yes i'm fascinated this this series is pearls of wisdom for, for sagas not going out club and i'm fascinated about what what is there a, a mantra is there a saying is there a piece of advice you've been given that's actually helping you get through this or just generally get through life a, a pearl of wisdom do you have one that you'd share with me well i mean you'd ask you told me this is the sort of the questions that you might be asking and i've had a bit of a think about it and um i think there 
there were two people that I can remember in life that I think gave me, um, yeah, gave me a bit of a wisdom along the way, made me think about things. And one was very early on in my career, Patricia Routledge. Oh, great. So, yeah. This is Bouquet. Not the table. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. What was she called, Mrs. Bouquet? And Hyacinth, was it? Hyacinth Bouquet. It was called Hyacinth, Hyacinth Bouquet. It was Richard Wilson. One foot. No, one foot in the grave, wasn't it? No. No. She had her own show, didn't she? She did. Hyacinth Bouquet. Oh, never mind. People. The wouldn't... audience. The people who watch it will know. <laughs> Having a blonde, and she moment. always thought she was a little bit better than she was, didn't she? She was a little bit posher than you know, aspirational, aspiration, a little bit delusional, shall we say? Anyway, and um, so it was one of my it, the, it was called Marjorie and Men, and it was uh, Patricia, um, um, sorry, Patricia Hayes was the mother. Oh, wow. Yes, and Patricia Routledge was the daughter. So Patricia Routledge was probably mid forties, early fifties, and was a single lady living with her mother. So can you imagine Patricia Hayes, who was hilarious oh, um, right. and brilliant, such a brilliant actress, brilliant. and um, and so she worked in a bank. Patricia Routledge's character. So it was called Marjorie and Men because every single week she went out on a date. Now this is before you know Tinder or any of those online dating things. So, um, and it was all about this sort of string of disastrous dates that she had, being a woman of a certain age. And I worked in the bank with her. I think my name was Debbie. I can't remember, but anyway, it was, and I, um, I had a nice role. It wasn't huge, but I was in it every week. And I was terrified of her. I mean, I was really terrified. And I would never really, and I was a bit like, okay, you've just got to sit and don't say anything until you're spoken to and just, you know, and I was very respectful. And very, I think, uh, I just sort of watched a lot and listened a lot. And, um, and it was a really fun job. And then at the end of it, she gave me a little present. And I was like, oh, wow. And she gave me these key, this set of keys. And it's a key ring, sorry. And it said, the keys to success. Wow. And it's, yeah. And she said, and I, and I sort of, and I was really shocked because I really didn't think that, and I was quite new to the industry. So I didn't even know people bought things for people in fact she was the one that told me about giving cards to people on first nights or or buying a present you know for somebody and she said to me I've really enjoyed working with you and watching you and you know uh, my advice is to keep that up always watch other actors listen watch and learn but not in a sort of patronizing way in a sort of a way that somebody who was older and had that wisdom yeah you know, and she said to me, you're going to go a long way, you are. And I was like, oh, you know, I was a bit embarrassed. And, and, but, um, but she was right. And I always remember what she said about really listening and watching and watching, your, uh, watching people, watching and, and getting your experience from, from um, and yeah, and just not being too sort of, um, I suppose, showy-offy when you first meet people. And I'm very much like that. Um, and I was always, and I, I, I am quite shy, but I've learned along the way to overcome that, like a lot of actors are, aren't they? Mm. And, um, and it just made me really think about what she said. And, um, oh, that's what she said. She said, oh, that was it. Always be nice to the people on the way up because you will meet them on the way down. <laughs> and we all know that. We all know and that. And it's sort of true. But just, but I just remember to this, I think it was only about 22, like I said, it was one of my first jobs. And this really beautiful silver key ring, the keys to success. Oh. I, was so, um, I was so overwhelmed by it. And, you know, especially saying, I've been looking at you and I've been watching you. And, and you know, you're very, um, you're obviously very passionate about your work. And, and I love the way you sit and you watch and you learn from people. I mean, I don't know. I could have said, actually, I wasn't. I was just bored or whatever. But, <laughs> but, um, but I really respected yeah. um, her. And I still do now. I think particularly, you know, older actors who've been in the industry a long time, I think we should respect them and we should learn from them. Yeah, and it um, is the meaning of being a proper apprentice, really, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's, yes. And I, not just for acting, but we can apply yes. it to but I also think I never went to drama school and I think having not gone to drama school I perhaps didn't have the tools that I would have picked, had at drama school so I think maybe I wasn't 
it wasn't it wasn't that I didn't have enough confidence. I just felt I had to listen more. I had to learn. So in a way I was, this was my apprenticeship. The first few years in my twenties, I was learning my trade. I was watching people and I was learning and I was listening, you know? Um, and I always said, say to my daughter, who's now an actress. And I said, you know, just go on. And, and you know what, if you, if you don't know something, just ask, ask, don't be frightened to ask. Never be frightened to ask a question. Exactly. You know, you sh that, that you're always willing to learn and always ask. But the next one, which I always remember, is when I went into EastEnders and I was 26 and I'd been a jobbing actress for quite a long time. And um, Julia Smith was the famous producer mm. who, um, of EastEnders. And she was, she was um, one of the first female directors on TV. I mean, she was a very prolific, prolific woman and quite scary, I would say. Um, because uh, there weren't many Julia Smiths around in those days. Mm -hmm. And initially I'd had an audition for EastEnders in the very beginning uh, to play Punk Mary, and I didn't get that role. And then Julia saw something else I did. So um, in, in 1988, I went to see her. And so I read the role, she told me about the role. She said, so do you want to do it then? And I went, oh, um, oh, oh yes, yes, please, um, yes. <laughs> so I said, are you offering it to me then? She said, yes, I'm offering it to you. Oh, um, I'd love you to do it. Do you want to go down on the spot? I promise you on the spot. And she said, it's 11 episodes and you're playing this. In fact, I got it wrong. I thought I was playing somebody called Corinne, who was actually the other producer that I'd met. I was so confused and overwhelmed by it. <laughs> I was like, I couldn't take it all in. And then she said, do you want to go down and meet everybody? Um, in the square and I said no thank you I'm fine I'm absolutely fine and um, <laughs> and she said now I just want to tell you this is going to change your life and I was like oh what do you mean she said well once you do this you're going to be on TV now this show is very successful and has been one of the most successful shows in a very long time and it's going to change your life she said, within a day of you being on screen, you're going to get fan letters. Now, do you know what they are? And I was like, oh. I said, well, I have done quite a bit of telly. No, no, no. You've never done anything like this. And I want you to always remember to keep your feet firmly on the ground. Never forget where you've come from. I swear, um, you know, keep your friends and your family very close by and never believe what anyone says about you, she said. <laughs> And she, she was right. She was right. My life did change. From the minute I was on that screen, I was getting fan mail. Um, I was getting recognised in the street. I mean, and thank God I had been a jobbing actress for quite a long time. And I'd been in a pop band. So I'd been on TV and I'd had that a little bit of, of fame, but nothing like EastEnders. And she was right. And I think, because a lot of people do say, you've been in the business a long time. You're very grounded. And I... And I always remember what she said. And I've seen people over the years, I saw people come into EastEnders when they were sweet, lovely, innocent 16 year olds and it totally changes their life. But, but not for the right reasons. They completely go the other way. They start believing in their own press. Yeah. Um, they start spending so much money. They suddenly change all their friends, have all these, and suddenly all these sycophantic people are around them and they believe in what everybody tells them. Yeah, and a distorted view, and it's it's yes. not fair, really, especially the yeah. young. Well, you mentioned sixteen-year-olds. I've seen it happen in Holly yeah. Oaks and Brookie as, and everything. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's that thing of never forgetting who you are and not forgetting your roots. And I think often a lot of people I who I feel that I knew went to drama school. I mean, I didn't get into drama school. I got I was only seventeen, but I got turned down by like eleven drama colleges. Eleven, and I. Firstly, it was very expensive. And then I just thought, you know what? I don't want to be rejected again next year and pay to be rejected. I'm not gonna do this. And so I decided that I was gonna answer ads and I, I've got some acting jobs. I've got one at the Gate Theatre, something else. And so in a way, those failures became successes for me. Yes, you turned you know, that round. You, yes, you, tur you have to turn it around and, and see, I always believe that things are meant to happen. And I think I was not meant to go. So what I was saying was sometimes drama school can turn actors into people that actually, that you're moulded by the drama school and it, it actually takes the part of you away from yourself and you become 
you you become a slightly different human being. Do you know what I mean? And and that's when I think often you do forget your roots. You're sort of stripped of your personality in a way. And I just think you just sort of you have to keep you've got to keep that bit of you there. Mm. And because if you let that go, then you completely lose your soul. Yeah. I think you you just destroy yourself, don't you? And well, then and then you, you're trying to be everything to anybody and. And that is very hard when, you know, I think when I was in EastEnders at the height of, of um, the huge storylines I had. And, and, and that's tough because I was playing a character. I was that character more than I was myself. Yes. Yes. And it would be very easy to lose yourself in yeah. that. And not, and I, if you haven't been warmed at the very beginning, yeah. stay grounded. And yeah. a lot of people don't understand why you would want to leave that. Mm. They just don't get it. And I think that I, having experienced all that, I've had all that and I've, and I've seen all that. And so therefore now I just, you know, I really still love being an actress like, actor, like you. I love, I don't want to get caught up in a long running job all the time. I get bored very quickly being a Gemini and I still like a challenge. I'm 57, but I still like a challenge and I like to be out of my comfort zone. I, I quite enjoy it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so do I. Like, I yeah. I, I said we share the same birthday, so we've obviously got quite a lot of similar character traits, yeah. and I recognise exactly what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Not. And I think. I sh sorry. Sorry, a lot of people. I was going to say, no, I don't like being totally, utterly out of my comfort zone, but no, a, no. a bit out of it is good. Not like Bear Grylls, like I did, at oh. the age of 51, deciding to do Bear Grylls. I mean, that sort of came out a bit of a, an empty nest syndrome, I think, wanting to suddenly do everything. When you know? Mia, Mia, your daughter, had left home. Yes, it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Maya, Maya. Yeah. She'd, she'd gone to university, yes. So I was like, okay, what's the craziest thing I could possibly do? <laughs> and it was crazy, I'd never do it again, but um, it but certainly did. challenged me, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, Oh, yeah. Michelle, thank you so much for talking to me, darling. That oh, is, pleasure. You've been revelatory and really, really good work, pearls of wisdom as well. And uh, oh. thank you so much. Thank you. I'll see you again soon, darling. Take care. See you, Gemini lady. Bye. 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 Bye.